Hassan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Murray. And good morning, Mr. Azar. Congratulations on your nomination. And congratulations to your family, too. Uh, this is a family fair, and we're very grateful for their willingness to support you in this work. Um, as you know, New Hampshire has been ravaged by the fentanyl, heroin, and opioid crisis, and we're in need of real resources to help those on the front lines combat it. HHS used a flawed funding formula to allocate resources from the 21st Century Cures Act, so the hardest-hit states, like New Hampshire, didn't get adequate resources. And now, even though we've asked them uh, to change the formula, HHS has declined to do that to update the formula for the second year of funding. But another big problem is that the Trump administration has refused to request additional funding to fight the crisis, which has prompted many to question whether the president is truly serious about addressing it. We need this administration to send a supplemental funding request to Congress for additional resources to combat the opioid addiction epidemic. So, Mr. Azar, yes or no, if you are confirmed, will you commit to me today that you will encourage the Trump administration to ask Congress for at least $45 billion in new supplemental funding to fight this crisis, a number that has had bipartisan support. So, Senator, again, thank you, and I'm really glad we, we were able to have the discussion about this terrible opioid crisis and the impact in New Hampshire. Um, I don't know the number, but what I will commit to you is if I am confirmed, um, I am going to work across the government to assess do we have the resources we need, and if I do not believe we have the resources we need to address the problem, work with the President and the Congress to do that. And, and I will tell you that I don't know a governor of either political party who believes we have the resources we need. I don't know anybody on the front lines of this crisis who thinks we have the resources we need. Will you also commit to examining all substance misuse funding sources and formulas and directing wherever possible under your authority more funds to the state's hardest hit by the crisis? I, I don't know the precise issues around that formula, how much is in statute and how much of it is discretionary. But absolutely, I, I know your concern about the money going to New Hampshire, and I, I certainly, if I'm confirmed, will work with you to look at that and see what flexibilities right. there yeah. are, and is it, and do we think it's the right and, approach? And, and the issue here is that the money's been formulated, been distributed basically on population as opposed to the, the overdose death rate in particular, per capita in particular states. Let's move on to another issue. Um, the drug company Allergan has recently engaged in unacceptable behavior to shield the patents of its dry eye drug Restasis from re review in order to prevent generic products from entering the market and denying consumers more affordable alternatives. In September, Allergan announced it had paid a Native American tribe to take ownership of the patents, and then Allergan licensed the patents back from the tribe, continuing to sell the drug as usual, exploiting the doctrine of tribal sovereign immunity to protect its profits. Allergan is renting the tribe's tribal sovereign immunity in order to protect its profits. The move ultimately is meant to stop generic versions of Restasis from coming to the market, which would be cheaper for patients. This outrageous first-of-its-kind deal was called a ploy recently by a federal district court judge. So I would like to know uh, what you think about this deal. Yes or no, should drug companies like Allergan be allowed to rent out tribal sovereign immunity in order to shield their patents from review? So I do not know as secretary if I would have any actual enforcement issues. So I do want to be careful yep, about I any particular that. situation. Right. Uh, but I would say I would share your concern about any type of abuse around extensions of patent or protecting from whatever legitimate processes there are for evaluating validity of patents. Well, I appreciate that. If uh, you are confirmed, I hope uh, you'll work with me and others on this issue, understanding that there are multiple agencies that have some uh, jurisdiction here. Um, I wanted to touch on another issue. The country recently learned of the case of Jane Doe, a 17-year-old young woman who was forced to continue her pregnancy against her will for over a month while in the custody of a shelter that contracts with HHS 
uh, overseeing unaccompanied minors. Jane Doe was eventually able to receive the abortion that she decided was necessary for her and that a court confirmed was necessary for her. But because of this case, it has come to light that the director of the HHS office, Scott Lloyd, used very disturbing tactics to block abortion access for the young women in these shelters. He prevented minors seeking abortion care from meeting with attorneys. He suggested placing pregnant minors with sponsors who would override the minor's choice about her pregnancy rather than placing her with family members, and he personally visited pregnant minors to pressure them to continue their pregnancies. Political appointees in Washington, D.C. at HHS should not be imposing their own ideology on these young women, nor should they be coercing them or shaming them for their choices. If confirmed as secretary, do you agree that you have an obligation to follow the Constitution and all the laws of the United States, even those you may not personally agree with? Oh, I am a lawyer and I take the obligation to follow the laws and constitution as interpreted by the courts as a solemn obligation, absolutely. Well, I am Thank glad you. to hear that and I know I'm running uh, over um, and I'll follow up on the discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Uh, Senator Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wanted to pick up where we left off on uh, the question about the case of Jane Doe, uh, the young woman I asked you about. And at the end of that, uh, question. You said that, yes, you agreed that you have an obligation to follow the Constitution and all of the law of the United States, um, even if you don't personally agree with it. Is that correct? Th that is correct, yes. So, and I'm glad to hear that. As you know, under the Supreme Court decisions in Roe v. Wade, women have a constitutional right to make their own reproductive health care decisions. So yes or no, will you commit to upholding those constitutional rights as well? I would, I would always work to ensure implementation of the Constitution and laws as currently interpreted by the courts, yes. Okay, thank you. I am glad to hear that. Um, now, I want to return to uh, the issue of essential benefits for a second. You have said that you would make the opioid addiction crisis a priority if you are confirmed. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that, but we need a lot more than lip service to make a dent in this epidemic. One of the key tools to combat this crisis is the set of 10 essential health benefits under the ACA, requiring that insurance cover insurance cover substance use disorders. In October, CMS proposed their 2019 Notice of Benefit and Payment Parameters, which if finalized, could let states seriously erode the essential health benefits, include the substance use, including the substance use disorder services benefit. If states develop their own benchmark, the rule would set a ceiling on the generosity of benefits that states can include in their plans. Before the ACA was passed, more than a third of plans on the individual market did not provide coverage from su for substance use disorder services. So I am very concerned that under the rule that's been proposed now, states would decide to limit this critically important benefit. So given your state stated commitment to addressing the opioid epidemic, yes or no, will you commit to rejecting the harmful changes to the essential health benefits in the proposed rule? I, I, I believe that states are most effective in determining, they, they, they are most effective in determining the benefit packages for their citizens and the circumstances you described earlier, even with New Hampshire, the unique circumstances of each state. But, but the problem, of course, then, is when they do that, the insurance companies come in and charge much more for that benefit. And that's one of the advantages of essential health benefits. I will tell you, nobody in my state plans to get an illness that their insurance doesn't cover. Nobody plans to become addicted to prescription drugs after surgery, let's say, and then you know, it says, oh, too bad I didn't buy insurance coverage for that treatment. And the advantage of the essential health benefits is that millions and millions of people not only got coverage through the ACA, but they got coverage that actually addressed their needs. Uh, as governor, and before, when I was in the state Senate, it was often the case that insurance companies kept dropping coverage for things they couldn't make money on. And eventually, the public picks up that cost. So I'd ask you to look at that issue uh, very, very closely because the essential health benefits in, under the ACA has been critical to fighting the epidemic in our state. Um, last topic I wanted to touch on with you, and, and you've heard a lot about it. Um, it's about drug pricing, and some of it's about uh, your past employment as president of the U.S. Uh, part of Eli Lilly. Um, I want to read a quote of yours from the New York Times article, because there is a reason that people are skeptical about your commitment to lowering drug prices. 
this is what you're quoted as saying in the New York Times. All players, wholesalers, wholesalers like McKesson and Cardinal, pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens, pharmacy benefit managers like Express Scripts and CVS Caremark, and drug companies make more money when list prices increase. The unfortunate victims of these trends are patients. So basically, in that quote, you're admitting that high list prices are hurting consumers and creating profits for drug companies. But yet, you continue, and you did this just last spring, to push the blame. Here, you've said it's everybody's, everybody's got a, a part to play. But last May, at a conference, you pushed the blame on everyone but pharmaceutical companies for high list prices, even saying setting list prices is something that, even though setting list prices is something that manufacturers directly control. You've also blamed insurance plan designs for high drug prices, but it's really the list price set by manufacturers that is driving the increases in what consumers are paying because requiring lower cost sharing for drugs will just lead to increased premiums, again, all at the expense of consumers. So I want to ask, now that you will be taking off your pharmaceutical co company hat and will be responsible for advocating for consumers, do you think it's time that the federal government take action to limit the profit drug companies can make off of setting high list prices, much the way we limit insurers right now uh, with the loss ratio? So in, in my earlier remarks, I certainly did not mean to be suggesting that list price was irrelevant or that pharma isn't have a piece of this also. Um, the challenge is, as we think about the burden on the patient when they walk into that pharmacy, if, if the list price is $500 and they have to bear that $500, or if, it, or if the list price is $250 and they have to bear that $250 under high deductible plan, both of those can be unaffordable for that patient. And so my point is, and where I want to and, work and is, and and so way, I think both I, can be I, helpful. I, I, I'm way yeah, over, we're, but just- We're running my, out of time. And my point is that it will, without some action by us, it will just be passed on in the insurance premium, which will also become unaffordable. Thank you.